Well, thanks, Perry, and thank you all for coming out. I know when I get home after work and I've had my supper and it's all cozy there in the, by the fire that it's really difficult to get back out and do anything at all other than just relax. So I appreciate everybody's effort to come out and hear about some pretty amazing things and little creatures, and some not so little, um, creatures that are living right outside your back door. Um, so without any further ado, let's start talking about um, birds in the north in the winter time. At first, I want to let you know just a little bit about the Alaska Bird Observatory. We're a nonprofit uh, that's been established in the Fairbanks area since 1991, and our main purpose on Earth is to get people jazzed about birds and to understand, again, what's living in their own backyard. We do this in a two-pronged uh, two pronged approach, uh, research and education. So there's no sense in us collecting all kinds of data if we don't tell people about it or if we hear about things. So what we want you to know is what is the cutting edge um, in the research that's happening. We do some of it, we report some of it. So um, we have a, a good research program and a fine education program too. Um, we're based at Kramers Field. Many of you might have been out to the banding station. Uh, it's behind the barns there and we've been banding there since 91. And in that course we've banded 82,000 birds and we're looking for volunteers. If anybody would be interested in helping us there, uh, we start banding in April and we'll band until the end of September. And even though it's a little chilly and windy today, spring's just around the corner. I can feel it. Um, the light, the days are getting um, longer and the birds will be back soon. Um, and right now you can come uh, visit us at our um, Center for Education and Research, which is behind the Wedgwood Resort. We have a nice classroom with some nice exhibits about local birds. And uh, come by and say hello and keep your eyes open for programs that we have, lectures and um, things like that, education programs. Alaska is an amazing place to study birds. Um, we have birds that come from all of the seven, or six of the seven continents um, in the summertime. We, most of the birds are common, and when we talk about common birds, that means that if you go into the right habitat at the right time of year, you're most likely going to see that bird. There are a number of them that are rare, that just come up every once in a while, and our casual and accidental birds are the ones that sort of slip over from Russia in the, in the Far East, that get caught in a wind or get a little adventurous and come our way. So Alaska is a mecca for birders and it's a mecca for um, bird research. Um, the birds that come here, like I said, go to six of the seven continents. We have a uh, northern weed ear, which is down on the bottom, uh, the black and white bird, this guy, who um, goes, uh, migrates all the way to Africa comes uh, to nest up on the um, up above on the north slope. Um, Arctic warblers, this little guy here, um, overwinters in the Philippines. Um, Arctic terns, we've all heard about those guys that go down south to Antarctica. They do a pole to pole um, migration every year, two round trips, or one round trip back and forth. Um, the plovers are heading down into the South Pacific. Um, this little guy here is a northern water thrush and he's going to Central and um, South America down in that way. And then we have guys that don't go quite so far, just go down into North Africa, or North America, um, our waterfowl and a lot of our sparrows. So what we know is that a lot of the birds, those uh, birds um, come up here in the summertime because we're so productive. That um, it's a great area to breed in because there are lots of bugs, which we all know, a lot of, a lot of um, birds eat bugs. There's lots of fish, small mammals. We're just, uh, we have productivity galore. Anybody who's um, grown those huge cabbages know that things grow really well in the summertime. And birds come up here to take advantage of that because they can feed their young Young, raise their young, get them off and get um, down. We have endless days, really a relatively benign um, environment so that birds come up here. But what we also know is that this is a, a, a beautiful place in the summertime. We get all our fun in in the summertime, but it doesn't last forever. So we have a very short um, time. In the summertime, things start to cool down, the leaves change, these um, swans are on their way out, and before you know it, we're back to snow. 
and the snows come and the birds leave. And the reason that the birds leave is not because it's cold, as we'll find out, because there are some birds that stay up here in the wintertime that do perfectly well at 40 below. But what happens when things get cold is that that food disappears. Um, the insects who need the warmth of the sun to fly around either um, die or they estivate or they go under bark, they freeze, some of them freeze, some of them can drop their body temperature to minus 60 and still be fluid. So the bugs are gone, the fish are all under the ice of the waters, um, the grass is gone, the grazing that the geese can do is, is um, over because the, it's all snow covered and um, it becomes a very empty place as far as energy goes. But there are some birds that can maintain themselves in this environment. Uh, oops. Some of the other guys take off for the sultry um, streams of Panama down in the south. Um, we have, again, the birds that go to Africa, spend their winter. The uh, weed ear spends its summer with the musk oxen on the slope and it sends its winter down with the cheetahs and the zebras in, um, in Africa. And some don't go quite so far. They go along the lovely Pacific coast. Um, these, um, Dunlin and um, Dowitzers are hanging out on the, on the Pacific coast down in San Diego. So they go to more moderate climes where there is plenty of food. But we're staying here in Fairbanks and we're residents just like these birds and there's plenty of things to do in the winter time that we can get out on the ski trails and we can make a living here in the winter time and we're going to talk about the birds that join us on these adventures. They're a little hard to find in the winter time. There aren't that many. You have to bundle up to go look. And these are some folks that are out on the Christmas bird count in Eagle a few years ago. And what we see in town is pretty much what I call the winter triumvirate. So we've got chickadees, ravens, and red poles. And um, in December, the Audubon Society um, sponsors a Christmas bird count and this happens across the lower 48s um, where folks go out in December or January and count how many birds they have uh, in their own backyard and here in Fairbanks we're doing really well if we get a um, couple dozen birds and so our numbers drastically reduce we're down an order of magnitude in the winter time when we think about these cold, dark days, that it's not only birds that are here, but there are other living creatures that hang out here in the wintertime, and what are their strategies compared to birds? And a lot of, bir a lot of animals, other than birds, um, take the strategy of avoidance. That they just aren't out in the environment. If we look at the wood frogs, um, a lot of good work's been done by Ken Story and um, Brian Barnes here at the university on these wood frogs that freeze solid in the wintertime. They just give up. It's like, psh, okay, I'm going to freeze. I'm not going to fight it. Um, they turn into essentially little frog sickles. I hear that if you lick them, they're sweet, but that's a whole other story. So there are other small creatures, the, um, uh, the voles and the lemmings, um, to make use of an area called the subnivian space. We all know from winter camping or um, when we're out and about or making snow shelters that snow is a very good insulator. So if you look um, at the top of a snowpack, if you take the temperature at the top of a snowpack and take the temperature at the bottom of the snowpack, you can see that you can get almost a 40 degree different temperatures in um, a temperature difference from the top to the bottom. Down at the very bottom at the base of that snowbank, the earth is still giving off heat that it collected in the summertime. So it gives a space right at the bottom that's just above freezing and that's where those little lemmings and voles hang out. That there are some voles that are up on the north slope that actually breed all the way through the winter. That the weather, that the conditions are nice enough at the bottom of that snowpack that they can get enough food for themselves and also to raise young. So these guys are avoiding the elements by going underneath the snow. And in the spring, you can see where they've been, um, the little snow trails underneath. So you can freeze, you can go under the subnivian space, or larger animals like bear can go underneath, and this isn't Charlie Robbins and Brian Barnes, those are just people that work on these guys, that you look at bears, the strategies for bears is to get really, really fat and then just hunker down, uh, ratchet down your metabolism, and again, avoid the elements, that you have enough fuel, you don't have much expenditure, you can make those um, energy stores last longer. But I'm asking you tonight to consider another creature that doesn't take the strategy of avoidance, that these little birds wake up every day, go out, and they have to find food to make it through that, win uh, th through that winter day. 
that they can't put on great masses of fat because they've got to fly, and we don't, and they don't can't afford to have. Um, and overweight, you don't want heavy wing loading, right? So you want to be slender enough to be able to fly around, but you need enough fat that you can survive. Um, you're also not going to be burrowing underneath the snow that you're out. You have to find a safe roof spot up above the snow, um, except in a couple cases that we'll talk about later, um, the two... Um, to spend the night. So what I'm, I'm, my big advocate for for avian stalwarts that these birds um, every day get up and face the elements like we do. We get up and we face the elements and get on with our day. So where I'd like to start tonight is with the smallest of all the all the birds that overwinter here, and that's the black-capped chickadee. And this is the bird that I've spent a lot of time looking at, and um, still, like Perry Sell, is, continues to amaze me when I look out my kitchen window when it's 40 below, and I'm all comfy with my cup of coffee, and these guys are just out there the size of little tennis balls um, going about their day. So black-capped chickadees um, are mostly found in deciduous forest. The, their cousins, the boreal chickadees, are are mostly found in coniferous or evergreen forest down in the spruce. So that's how they divvy up the environment here. Um, and you'll find both in sort of mixed forest areas. A black-capped chickadee weighs about 12 grams. And so we're not real metric friendly here. So 12 grams, when you, last time you flew on Alaska Airlines to Mexico or wherever you went a little bit warmer a while ago, they gave you a, a bag of snacks. And that snacks, that handful of snacks weighed 14 grams. So that amount of mass was more than a chickadee out there in the winter time. So 12 grams isn't very much. It's a handful of paper clips. It's a couple gram crackers. So they're tiny, tiny birds. And like I said, they're the smallest ones that are up here in the wintertime. Boreals are just a tiny bit bigger but not much. So this is the lower limit for birds that overwinter. The other interesting thing among many things about black tap chickadees is that they're not built especially for northern climates. They are found all across North America so they have this really wide range um, that we have birds up here but then they go all the way down into where things aren't don't get very cold in the winter time here and where I spend a lot of my time in the Seattle area it's not very cold at all so it's not like they're a northern bird that's built for um, for cold temperatures. Um, they're found regularly up to Anik uh, Tuvik Pass, so up into the Brooks Range. And I've also had calls from uh, the last few years there have been black-capped chickadees in Barrow. Um, what the heck they're doing there, I have no idea. But um, they overwinter in people's Arctic entries. So there are birds that make it through the winter up there. They go out to Kotzebue, out to the west. Um, the other cool thing about the ones up here is that we have the Boone and Crockett chickadees of North America. Um, the 12 gram chickadees up here are the largest chickadees of the range. The birds that are in the Seattle area are about 8 grams, so there's a large uh, size variation across the range. Now, this isn't anything new to anybody that lives here, but this is just sort of gives you an idea of, of what these birds face. Um, we start off here in July, um, go into um, June this way, so it's a little bit different than the regular calendar. Um, right here is about zero, so freezing, and you can see that most of the temperatures, a normal high of a chickadee that chickadee's going to see um, for most of the year is below freezing, so that there are lots of cold temperatures. But but the other thing to realize too is that we get it's pretty nice here in the summertime so that there are high temperatures so again that you just can't adapt to that cold climate in the wintertime that you have to be able to fly around when it's 60 70 degrees so that it's uh, it's not just one apt adaptation but it's this flexible ability to be at um, all different kinds of temperatures and this is another thing I don't need to remind anybody about, but I did give a toke, uh, talk in Toke a little while ago, and when this slide came up, somebody commented that that must have been a warm day there. Um, and so, and there are chickadees in Toke too. So, but we've had our cold temperatures, everybody experienced it this winter. But one thing to consider when you're looking out and it's minus 40 degrees, minus 49 degrees, that this little chickadee that's sitting on a branch out outside your kitchen window, that inside next to its heart, because it's warm blooded just like mammals, that the temperature inside that little bird is 108 degrees. Birds weigh it, run a little bit warmer than mammals. So right next to its heart, at the very core of its, temp of its body, it's 108 degrees. And right on the outside of those feathers, 
meters, which is not more than an inch and a half away, it's minus 40. So over the a gradient of about an inch and a half, you have a 150 degree temperature gradient. And if you're trying to keep your house warm, you know how hard that is. So what these guys have to do every day is gain enough food for them to maintain that metabolic fire that that can maintain this temperature, right? So you have to find the fuel to make this heat, and then you have to hang on to this heat because you just don't want to have it let loose into the environment. So it's quite um, a physiological feat, if you ask me. But the other interesting thing, too, is that they don't have just one strategy. It's not just one trick that allows them to do this. That they have a number of adaptations or a number of tweaks on their physiology that all other birds have, but they just ratchet it up a little bit more. That they just take it one more step that allows them to survive up here. So they didn't have to invent anything new. They just took all the basic physiology and a lot of the basic behavior that all birds do and then just tweak it a little bit. So the main problem up here to get through the winter, so you're faced with two things. One is that it's cold. There are low, constantly low ambient temperatures, and we all know that. But the other part to add on top of that, not only is it cold, it's not light very long. And that birds, in general, are diurnal, which means they do most of their business during the day. So you have, in December, if you're a small bird, or even a medium-sized bird, you have a, little, a limited amount of time to gain the energy that you need to survive that day and also 18 hours in roost because you're going to be sitting in one spot for 18 hours and you need to have enough fuel on board to survive that long time uh, to generate enough heat to do that. So when I was working on chickadees and um, we were, I was trying to figure out what was going on, it seemed like there were two main things that the birds were doing and one of the uh, one suite of adaptations were with their physiology and the other suite was with their behavior. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go through each one of these individually and we can look at what these little tweaks are that they do. So I'm going to talk about the physiology first. So there are three things that they're really well insulated and they have this incredible ability to lay down fat. Um, and they also use this trick called nocturnal hypothermia. So let's go through each one of these individually. So again, here's this bird on, the, on a branch trying to um, defend this huge temperature gradient. and um, as we know, again, too, that we use feathers um, in our down sleeping bags and our down coats, that feathers um, are a really good insulator. So what the birds up here do, and when we look at their feathers, and there are different kinds of feathers on a bird's body. There are the contour feathers that form like the shell on the outside of the birds. And then there are their down feathers that are underneath um, that uh, provide the insulation. And then we have these other little feathers that are sort of a cross between a contour feather and a, and a down feather called these semi-plumaceous feathers. But the other thing to remember, too, is that it's not the feathers themselves that are providing the insulation. What the feathers do is that they trap air in air is a really good insulator. So if you're really downy, and that's why birds um, fluff up their feathers, is that the, the, the farther up they fluff their feathers, the more air that they can trap underneath. So the better insulated they are, they are. And they do this by moving their feathers up and down. And as mammals, we can do that a little bit. When somebody walks up behind you and scares you, or you see something scary, your, the hair on the back of your neck stands up so that we can control our, our fur a little bit. But um, not very well, because we have other means of insulation. Birds have a really fine control on how far up they can fluff their feathers and how much insulation there is there. So if you have a lot of um, feathers and you erect them to get air in there, then you form this, um, this warm air space underneath. Um, but the other thing that chickadees do up here, if we look at the fine structure of a feather, and here are these downy feathers, a plumaceous feather. This is a contour feather, but the basic structure is pretty much the same on all of them. If we take a look at an electromicrograph, or we'll, um, we'll look really close here at the, at the shaft of the feather and how these barbs go off. If we look at these barbs, then we go a little bit farther and we look at these barbules. And this is what the bird uses to lock those feathers together. So when you erect your feathers, 
feathers, you can lock the feathers together and you fill for them sort of like a shell um, that allows the air to, st um, to stay inside the feather. So what the chickadees in Alaska have are if you look at the, these barbules, there are more of these barbules. So they have a better ability to latch on together and to hold that air close to their body to form this shell. So if you compare the feathers of birds that were born in Alaska compared to the feathers of birds that were born in um, Seattle, that the number of barbules are more on the birds up here and also the absolute mass of feathers is more in Alaska than they are down in the lower 48s. So what they do essentially is that they buy the heavier coat so that they have this really a lofty coat. So you, they're very well insulated compared to other chickadees in the range. So you have a good coat. The next thing you're worried about is fuel. So where are you going to get this fat, which is the most efficient fuel to use? There are more calories in a gram of fat than there are in a gram of protein or gram of carbohydrate. It's a really nice little nugget and that's why we're craving butter and chips and all those good things in the winter time is because we're looking for that fat. Chickadees up here have an amazing ability to lay down fat and you can they come into your feeder, they're eating seeds, they're eating peanut butter, they're coming after suit and suet and it seems like they're constantly eating. But if you birds are interesting again in that you can see through their skin unlike um, mammals um, and if you look at the furcula which is the area on a bird right here where you have the wishbone um, on a turkey or a chicken there's a little divot between the breast bones and in the winter time if you blow away the feathers if you have a bird in hand and you blow away the feathers in here you can see that divot this furcular space fill up with fat over the course of a day so when they come out of roost they have a little bit of fat down at the bottom if you look at them at noon it's about half full and right before they go to roost they have this bulging fat store right here in their chest so you can see this happening so I was looking at birds here in Fairbanks and this is the fattening rate so how fast that furcula fills up with fat this is the photo period so as the days we get into winter the days are shrinking so photo period goes down and I measured the change in fat in their furcula over the course of the day. And the crazy thing is, is as we lose daylight, so as, as photo period gets less, goes down and down until we get to the solstice here, that this fattening rate goes up. So they're fattening fastest. They're putting on fat fastest in the shortest amount of time. So as it gets darker, they ramp up their ability to lay down fat. So this is crazy. Um, how can you, in less time, put on fat quicker? Um, but th it's also very good because you need to put that fat on because you need that fat for overnight. So I was talking to a friend of mine who works on dark-eyed juncos migration. Uh, my good friend Marilyn Ramanofsky, who's um, at Davis right now, and she was looking at how juncos fatten. So she said, and much to my chagrin because I was a biology student, I was not a chemistry student, to look at the biochemistry of fattening. And it's like, oh, chemistry. But it's very, very cool. Um, there is an enzyme in you right now that's hanging off your fat cells and your muscles. There's a, it's the same enzyme that's in brown trout, it's in insects, it's in birds, it's in mammals. It's a universal enzyme. So it's not anything new. It's a very ancient enzyme called lipoprotein lipoprotein. Pace. And that's the gateway from getting fat in your bloodstream, from the bloodstream into either a muscle cell or a fat cell. And if you put in a fat cell, then you can store it in there. So this is the scary di diagram, but it's not really all that bad. So if you think of this as the surface of a cell, and, there, and this is hanging into the bloodstream, what happens is this enzyme called lipoprotein lipase, which is this little lollipop thing right here. And this is really what it looks like in real life, trust me, like Perry said. Um, that it hangs off the surface of the cell into the bloodstream and as these globules of fat go by after that come out of the fat or the suet or the peanut butter or the seed um, travels through the bloodstream after digestion it gets grabbed by these enzymes that are hanging in the bloodstream and inside of this big triglyceride or this chylomicron which is a fat globule are these triglycerides. And so what this enzyme does is cleaves off 
takes all the fatty acids off, which is where the energy is, and then they move into the fat cell. And then the backbone goes down to the liver. So what it does is essentially turns the fat cell into a fat sponge. Any globule of fat in the bloodstream that goes by is going to get grabbed like a magnet and pulled in. And then the fat, the good part, is cleaved off and goes into the cell. And then that's what we see accumulate in the in the um, circular space of the black cap chickadee. What I found when I ran this assay, when I looked at the fat, is that the levels of this enzyme in black cap chickadees was higher than had ever been measured in any organism before. So what they do is they take this enzyme that everybody has, it's nothing special, and just crank it up. So they essentially grab any piece of fat that they digest. So they're very, very efficient, and that allows them to put down fat fast. The other cool thing is as the season goes on and they don't need that much fat, the activity of that uh, enzyme decreases. So they turn it up when they need it, and they turn it down when they don't. So biochemistry is not so bad. So we have a warm coat on, we have our fat on our, um, in our furcula, and they also put it in their abdomen a little bit. So you've got your fuel stores for the night, but then the sun starts to go down and you're going into your roost and it's, you're getting ready for 18 hours. How can you make that fat store last as long as possible? And one of the things that these guys do is that they drop their body temperature. So it's essentially the same principle that we all have is when we go to bed, we turn the thermostat down. We don't need to crank the furnace all night because um, we want to save fuel. We want to make that fuel delivery last as long as possible. So what black cap chickadees do, as soon as they go into roost, they hunker down, they put their heads down, they fluff up their feathers to get that insulation going, and then they turn their temp body temperature down 10 degrees. If any one of us turned our body temperature down 10 degrees, we would not come out of roost. It would be a curtains for all of us. So what they have an ability to do is to turn down their metabolic demand over the course of the night that allows that fat to last longer. And just by turning it down a little bit, they don't gain very much each hour. Each hour, by turning down their metabolic rate a little bit, they only gain four minutes of fuel. But if you multiply that by 18 hours, four minutes every hour, then you have a little over an hour's worth of extra fuel to get them all the way through the night. So it's a little tweak in it, but it's an efficient tweak. And when they come out of roost, they still have a little bit of fat because you need fuel to go get your breakfast. So they turn down the thermostat enough to make that fat last through the night and then let them do this every day go about their day. Chickadees have to go replace that fuel every day or they will die. They need to come into their roost with a full uh, amount of fat on their body so that they can burn it overnight so that they can go out and do it again the next day. So nocturnal hypothermia, and there are only other a couple um, other creatures that can do this. Um, um, night hawks also turn their body temperature down, and hummingbirds. And it's interesting to note that when um, black or bears go into hibernation that they also only drop their body temperature 10 degrees. It seems like there's a lower limit to how far you can drop your body temperature and then rewarm in the next morning. Okay, so that's the physiology part of it. So you're very well insulated, you have a really efficient way of putting on fuel, and you can turn down your body temperature to make that fuel last longer. So what about the behavioral aspects? So that's sort of the hardwired cellular aspect of it. But behavior is pretty plastic, and you can learn things that will help you survive. And that there are three main things that these guys do on a behavioral level that helps them through, um, through the winter, too. And one is to set up caches. And then another one is to find a really good spot to be overnight that's well insulated and um, is well protected, and also to make the day last a little longer by getting up early. So caching, if anybody has feeders here out in August, you'll notice the birds are starting to make trips. That they come in and they take a seed and they go away and they come back and they go away and they come back. What these birds start to do in August when, um, the, when we're starting to lose light, and that's the trigger for this caching, is that they take food and they put it throughout their territories. In the wintertime, chickadees stay in a general area. So they have a territory that they are in a flock that they defend against other flocks. So they're 
they're going to be in one spot for most of the winter. So they go through, and this is typical chickadee habitat. This is just up by my cabin in a, in a birch woods up there. But if we had like a little sensor that showed where seeds and bugs were, you would see that there are little pieces of food scattered throughout that, um, throughout that forest. What they do is they take seeds and bugs and caterpillars and spiders um, and put them in underneath the bark or where the uh, branch and the um, trunk meet. So they scatter it all throughout their um, through their territory. Um, not like squirrels that have sort of set middens, but they put it all throughout their territory. So when it's 40 below and you don't have much light, you can go get food. You don't have to look for food. Um, you know where food is. And that's the second part of this that's really interesting is that if you put something away, you got to remember where you put it. So what they have found in uh, lab studies is, is if they look at the brain of a chickadee throughout this caching period, um, and again, this happens to all of us, there's a section of our brain called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is where we store our memories. And in chickadees, it's the same place um, in all vertebrates. Uh, you store your memories in the hippocampus. And um, if you look at the size of the hippocampus over the winter time, starting in August when they start to put away food, the size of the hippocampus increases. So the brain area increases to hold all those memories. Um, which is cool in two ways. One, that 20 years ago we had an idea that once you made all your brain cells, you're done. Um, that after it, it was a downhill slide with each glass of red wine that you had, you were going to lose brain cells. But with this work on chickadees and also on uh, gray jays and um, some of the other corvids, that um, this the brain brain size is really plastic so that you can, uh, they grow new neurons, so it's neurogenesis to hold these memories and then um, as the season goes on that area shrinks back down and other areas of the brain take over that place, mostly the areas of the brain devoted to reproduction. So you, you, cash, you uh, swap out depending on the season. Um, and this is, it's really interesting to me to think that these birds in the lab have been shown to found, find pieces of food that they put away four months previously. And this is from me trying to find my key car keys in the morning, where so to hang on to those ideas that long. But I think there's a little bit more um, pressure on these chickadees to find their food um, than me finding my car keys because they'll turn up. The other cool thing, uh, well, the other thing that you need um, is a place to spend the night. Again, in the wintertime, you're going to be in one spot for 18 hours, so it better be a pretty nice place. And if you look at the very top of this birch right here, you can see that it's a broken off top. And right at the very tip top there, for two weeks, I watched a chickadee come in and out of that spot um, to roost. So he would come in um, in the evening and then um, out in the, and it was a single bird. When I was doing my thesis, I did a lot of work um, in the lab, and what I really wanted to know was what these birds were seeing out in the wild in the, w in the winter at night, because that seemed like the most stress stressful time. And I thought, okay, so what I'll do is I'll wait at my feeder, and when the birds leave, I'll just follow them to their roost. How hard can that be? Oh, um, <laughs> those birds are fast. <laughs> And um, it's snowy and, and it was pretty hard. So there definitely had to be a plan B. I just couldn't watch. And then uh, plan B came out about uh, with a little tiny radio transmitter. We've heard all these great stories of following um, Bartel Gottwoods down across the Pacific down to the, uh, but these are all satellite transmitters. And uh, with a bird as tiny as a chickadee, what you need is something that weighs a half a gram. So this is a half a gram transmitter um, that I put on the birds. Um, it, the a little elastic bands. These are two little pieces of elastic like you use to make, you know, bracelets or something like that. And they, you put them on like a, a, a climbing harness over their legs. So what happens is that the, um, the, back, uh, the transmitter rides right above the tail and the antenna goes off uh, the back. And so I put um, these out on birds and they seem to have no, um, I, all my birds survived. They survived minus 30. Uh, and um, the other thing I found was you get smarter as you go through your PhD program, I think, because I used to try to follow them to follow them to roost. Uh, and again, it's hard to track them. And then I realized, hey, they're going to be in one place for 18 hours. If I let them go to roost and then track them down, I'm not chasing them all over. So I would let them go to roost, go out at night, find the roost, 
and then go back in the morning to make sure it was the right place and they would fly out. Um, so what I found over the course of the winter is that none of these birds ever roosted with another bird. They were all single roosters. So they're spending their night by themselves in tiny little um, holes in, the, in birch stobs at the end of birch um, limbs and things like that. My other grand plan was to put um, uh, thermometers in their roost, but most of the roosts I found were um, at least 10 meters up. So that's still a uh, work in progress. So this, um, I found this roost um, with, a, um, with a radio. Um, and it seems like they go back to the same place again and again. The other thing that they do is, and this is from work, um, a little, an elegant study by Bryna Kessel, who was up at the museum for a long time, is that she watched the time that birds come, came in and out of her feeder over the course of a couple of years. And what the birds do is they're, um, they don't wait until the sun gets above the horizon, that they start flying just when you can make out um, trees, just at civil twilight, when there's enough light to sort of see objects. So that they come out of roost when they have a left light that they're not going to smack into a tree as they're flying around, but it extends their day on either end by an hour. So rather than having our four-hour day from sunrise to sunset, that they gain an hour on either end of, uh, of the day by flying at these very low light levels. So they make the best of their day. And as things get brighter, um, they'll wait longer and longer to come out. So in the spring, they won't come out at civil twilight. They'll come out at actual sunrise, uh, sunrise and then go in at sunset. So that they, um, they give themselves the opportunity opportunity to, um, to forage for a much longer period of time by using this low light level. So I was pretty excited after the course of finding all this stuff out that, you know, that the way that small birds survive up here is that you put on fat really fast daily, they drop their body temperature, they're really well insulated, um, they cache, and um, they roost in these things singly or in, in single roosts every night. So it's like, okay, we, we figured this out. So I thought, okay, let's look at red poles. And let's see how this chickadee model applies to red poles, which is a little finch that comes in and um, to feeders on mass in the, in the wintertime. And they're a little bit bigger than chickadees. They're about 16, 14 to 16 grams. So I started looking at red poles, and what I found out is that they don't do anything like chickadees at all. So here we have another small bird living in the same habitat, but have a totally different strategy for making it through the winter. Um, they don't cache food. Um, they don't fatten daily. They have a fat store, but it's, uh, it's more of a fallback. It stays at the same level from day to day. They don't drop their body temperature at night. But what they do do is interesting, and it, it, it's based on what they eat. Um, so they're a birch and alder specialist. So who needs to cash birch seeds? It's all over the place. So your cash is a birch stand. Um, so they eat these tiny little seeds, but what they do before they go into roost is that they have, on either side of their neck, they have a little pouch right at the back of their mouth um, called a diverticulated esophagus. So they have two little packs right here, and they fill those full of birch seeds or alder seeds or your sunflower chip before they go into roost. And again, this is about 10% of their body mass um, that they put on. Like chickadees put on 10% of their body mass in fat. These guys carry 10% of their body mass in seed each night. So they have a fuel store, but it's in a different place. So what they do is they go into roost. They have this um, these seeds that are readily available, and it's just like stoking a stove. So that's those seeds make their way from the sides of their neck down into their gut, and they have to maintain high body temperature so they can digest it. So it wouldn't help them to, um, to reduce their body temperature. So that they're using a readily available food that they don't have to cache, even though it's tiny, if you go out now, that this is all birch seed that's fallen off the trees. And after we had that warm stop snap about a month ago, you could see that the birch all opened and dropped their seed. It was brown around a lot of the birch. So they dropped a lot of their seed. But these guys are making a living up here um, through the winter, just feeding on that. So 
that's a totally different strategy. So we have the chickadee strategy, a red pole strategy. The red poles are part of this Carjuay line finch group, which are northern finches that are built for the north. They're mostly northern tier bird. And because they're a finch, they're a seed specialist. And so they travel the boreal forest and mostly in a east to west migration instead of a north to south migration, eating um, seeds um, from the birch, um, the spruce, uh, and um, alders. Uh, the other cool thing about this group of birds is that they're um, reproductively opportunistic and I mean that in a positive sense um, so that they're um, uh, they are able to almost almost every day or every month of the year um, they can breed because they're on these um, seed crops and just a tiny uh, short story about white wing crossbills because they're just so amazingly cool uh, you can see that they get their name by this real crossbill that's not a deformity that's the way they're built and they use that specialized bill to stick into uh, spruce cones and open up the scales uh, and then they have a tongue like a parrot where they reach in and flip the seed into their mouth so they have this special adaptation to get at spruce seeds so there's white spruce cone specialists spruce seeds specialists and they follow white spruce cone crops across the boreal forest and they're unpredictable. So we never know when we're going to have um, crossbills around here. They're very social, they move in flocks, but because they find a huge cone crop with lots of high energy seeds that they stay there and they start to breed almost immediately. There are only two months of the year and that's December and January where there aren't active red uh, white wing crossbill nests in the north. Um, so that in February, when it was minus 40, um, some years that there can be a female white wing crossbill sitting on eggs out in the boreal forest. They build a very well insulated nest. It's a very small. She sits in it just like the cork in a bottle. She's incubating the eggs and what the male does is he comes back and forth and feeds her on the nest while she's incubating. When the eggs hatch he feeds her and the, fledg and the nestlings that are in the nest and then when they get bigger and can thermoregulate on their own they both um, breed at the same or they both feed the young at the same time. So essentially if there's enough white spruce cones around these birds can breed almost at any time of year. Um, there's a uh, color dimorphism. The, the males get this bright red color because the testosterone that they have can convert the, the um, dyes in their food, the carotenoids in their food, the pigments into a bright red color. So the brighter red the male the more testosterone he has and that's how the females picks mates. So let's go from little birds to big birds. Um, this is a, a, a bird that we have and it's a, a good um, buddy of ours through the winter time here in Fairbanks and I like to say that there's really nothing common about the common raven. They're pretty amazing birds. Um, the birds that we have here in Fairbanks in the winter time come from all over the state. Um, that there have been birds that have banded up on the north slope that have been found in Fairbanks and birds that have been banded in Fairbanks found out on the sewer Peninsula. Um, so they congregate in Fairbanks because again of energy. Um, it's all driven by energy in the in the winter time and the energy here that we're thinking about is um, McDonald's and um, the dumpsters and uh, transfer stations and things like that. So they're a sort, they, they seek out high source of, it, of energy. They're big birds, they're almost two pounds worth of bird so that they don't have the, the hanging on to heat problems or the surface to volume ratio problems that the smaller birds have. Um, we see them all around. They're starting to pair up now. We can see them flying around and doing their um, their mating sort of flights around. Um, what else do they want to say about ravens? They're really um, amazingly social birds. This guy was down by the library and I don't know what the heck he's doing with that snowball. Um, but um, he was sitting there for a while and then he took it over and he put it in a tree somewhere. Um, so that they're um, highly social, um, bright birds. And um, there are a couple interesting things that I wanted to tell you about ravens. One is that um, they're social roosts. Um, here in Fairbanks there have been roosts reported of up to 300 
350 birds in one spot each night um, out in Goldstream Valley a few years ago. And I was talking to a guy b before the program that said right now, um, as we're sitting here, there's probably around 100 ravens sitting at Lowe's um, waiting for the um, dawn so that there's a, a congregation there. And what we think is going on at these big roost sites is that they're used as information centers, um, that they communicate among themselves where um, good food sources are, um, sort of the dominance hierarchy within the group. They um, pick out their um, uh, mates during this time, but there's a lot of so social interaction in these um, in these roost sites, in these information centers, and we can see in the winter time birds either streaming out um, the steeps, so there must be a roost out that way, and also out Goldstream Valley. But you can see them at dawn and dusk moving back and forth across town. Um, so. That's one thing. The other thing that um, I notice mostly about ravens, when they're sitting up on those light standards as you're driving by, so you've got bird feet on um, metal for most of the most of the winter. And a question that a lot of people ask me is like, okay, so there's no feathers on these feet. So how do you keep these feet from snapping off? How do they keep their feet intact um, in their legs? How do they keep them warm? When it's really cold, you can see, especially the birds at your feet, or they're sitting down on their feet. And even the ravens walking around the parking lot and Fred's are down on their feet to keep them warm. But the other thing that they have is a setup that was found um, found in birds and also in caribou and moose and wolves um, and a lot of this pioneering work was done up here at IAB by Larry Irving um, in the 60s and it's a it's a way that the circulation is set up called the countercurrent circulation and what it's set up to do is to limit heat loss. The other thing to think about when you're thinking about these animals that have feet in the snow or legs on the snow or even the ducks on the china right now so they have their web feet down in the cold water is that on those legs it's not like there's much muscle or anything like that. It's mostly tendon and skin and bone. So there's not a whole lot of flesh that they need to keep warm. So what they do is that they um, they have a, a way that the circulation is set up where you have um, the artery. So arterial blood is coming from your body core and it's hot. Uh, venous blood is going back to your body core and it's cold. And so you don't want to lose your core heat out of your artery and you don't want to shock your body with cold heat blood coming back into your, the core of your body. So what happens is that um, in, in the legs of these creatures, these the veins and the arteries are put right back together or next to each other. And what that does is it sets up this temperature gradient. So this warm blood coming out, coming down into the leg is being cooled by the cool blood coming back up. So that way you can conserve heat, that it's just not this load of heat that's being lost. And that you, from the from where the feathers are down to the toes, that we have a, this huge temperature gradient. And right at the feet, it's just above freezing. Every once in a while what happens is that warm blood is flush down into the bottom or to the extremities to the toes and all that to warm it up every once in a while. So blood is shut off here. There's this little shunt and every once in a while those valves are opened and hot blood comes out um, to warm things up and then it's shut down again. So again it's a, a way of controlled um, cooling and heating uh, to maintain um, the right temperature where things are flexible and alive but not you're not losing heat out the end. So let's move a little bit from passerines to some other um, birds that you'll see at your feeder. This is a downy woodpecker um, and they all come into your feeders to look eat for suet and um, peanut butter and things like that. They're mostly insectivores and this guy is about the size of the palm of your hand. So it's a black and white um, woodpecker but then we have this other black and white woodpecker called a hairy woodpecker. So that there are, they look almost identical but there's a size difference. So the hairy woodpecker is um, about the size and a half of a downy woodpecker but that doesn't do you much good if you're just seeing one or the other. So if we put them side by side, hairy versus a downy woodpecker, you can see that how you can really tell these guys apart is by their bill size. So this is a hairy woodpecker, this is a downy woodpecker, and when you have them at your feeder, if you just look at the bill, you can see in a hairy woodpecker that bill is about the size of the head. So you don't need a hairy or a downy woodpecker there to compare sizes. You can just compare the big the big billed bird, it's the hairy woodpecker, the smaller billed bird 
is a downy woodpecker. So you can see that that's not anywhere near the size of the head. So we have them come into our feeders. They're um, just about now they're starting to drum and getting ready for, um, for spring breeding. The, the female will start excavating a, um, an area to, um, they nest in um, cavities. She'll excavate a cavity. They'll both incubate. Um, males will incubate at night. The females incubate during the day and they both help raise the young. These guys don't um, have a fluctuating fat um, cycle like chickadees that they may maintain a little bit of fat, but mostly get their uh, fuel by um, going around and um, getting a lot of those um, grubs that are inside the trunk, but also a lot of our insects overwinter underneath bark, and so they're gleaning around for, um, for insects that way. So they're mostly eating um, insect material, animal material that way. But they'll be here throughout the winter, and they also have a huge range like chickadees down into the lower 48s. So. Let's see, another interesting guy that um, has some interesting adaptations for um, overwintering up here are willow ptarmigan, or in ptarmigan. So there are three grouse that are up here, um, sh uh, sharp-tailed grouse, rough grouse, and spruce grouse, and also three ptarmigan, um, the white-tailed ptarmigan, the willow ptarmigan, and the uh, rock ptarmigan. And this is a willow ptarmigan, and they all survive by eating stuff that you wouldn't think could keep them alive. Um, they're like moose. They're spending their winter eating twigs and sticks and um, things that you wouldn't think that they could digest and they do it with the help of microbes just like the musk oxen and the caribou and the moose. Um, they're not ruminants, they don't have a big four um, gut uh, fermentation system but they have a little um, area called a cecum that houses these little microbes and so they eat all this essentially non-nutritious food, um, twigs and buds and leaves and then what happens is that the microbes work on that. The microbes can produce some um, fatty acids and they also can digest the microbes and then they get their, um, their nutrition from that. So that's through the, um, through the help of microbes that these guys survive the winter um, by eating such poor nutritional um, things. Um, the other thing that they have is an adaptation where they grow uh, feathers on their feet. So they have feathers on their legs but then as the days get shorter, um, they prepare for winter by growing feathers on their toes. So all around um, their toes, they grow feathers and really long claws. So what they do essentially is that they grow snowshoes um, that allow them to move around in the wintertime on top of the snow and um, to get around that way. And it also insulates their, um, their legs too. The other interesting thing that these guys do, and this is quite the handsome guy if you ask me, is that um, they have a crop Unlike the red poles that have a crop on the back of their neck, they have a crop right in front of their furcula. And what they do before they go to roost is that they fill that up with birch, um, birch buds, or not birch buds, willow buds, and sticks and twigs and leaves. And I've seen them the size of a softball. So what they do, again, is pack a lunch, put it on their chest, and then they sit and they move that through their digestive system. The microbes um, go ahead and break that down and that's how they gain their energy. So they sit quietly. Um, sometimes they'll burrow down into the snow so as an insulator, so they have a nice roost to hang out and they'll sit there and very quietly digest their meal. And then when, they're, they, when their crop is empty, they'll move along and um, go start foraging again. And again, we've got lots and lots of twigs so that they can find food when they need to. So let's see. There are a few other birds that are here in the winter time, and I'll just talk to them because we're running out of time. We'll talk about these guys a little bit. And these are passerines, which is just another word for songbirds. Um, and each one of these have a, has, a, has their own little unique story that we could talk about, but I'm just going to give you a few tidbits. The Bohemian waxwing is around, and we are getting more and more of them because of uh, we're planting more ornamental trees. There's a lot up at the university and downtown. And that they eat these berries. They're frugivores. So in the summertime they, they could eat dragonflies and bumblebees and things like that but in the wintertime they eat almost exclusively fruit 
And as anybody knows, if um, that sometimes these fruits ferment. Um, so what there have been stories of birds, these um, Bohemian waxwings, getting a little tipsy from eating fermented berries. But the other amazing thing is that they share an enzyme with us um, that no other bird does, and that's alcohol dehydrogenase. So we have an enzyme in our liver that allows us to break down alcohol, and so do Bohemian waxwings. So that they have alcohol dehydrogenase in their liver to be able to detoxify the alcohol that they're picking up in these berries that they're finding for their food. Um, another bird that's just amazing to me, I've lived in Alaska not that long, um, since the early 90s, but one of the first things I learned when I came up here in the wintertime is that you do not want to get wet. Don't get wet in the wintertime because that's just bad news. American dippers, um, what some people used to know as water oozles, um, stay up here in the wintertime. There are, right now, at this moment, there are American dippers up in the Arctic Refuge spending the winter. There are Arctic dippers, or American dippers in the Brooks Range. There are ones out at Chena Hot Springs. And these guys in the dead of winter are jumping in and out of mountain streams, um, feeding themselves on uh, underwater invertebrates which just, it's astounding, it's crazy. Um, it would be amazing field work um, to figure that out. Um, but uh, they're a small bird the size of a robin that stay up here in the winter time. Um, what else, or nuthatches should be show, or not, that's the nuthatch, that's the snow bunting. Snow bunting should be showing up here shortly. Um, they uh, winter down in the lower 48s, but the males come up here first, and um, there was actually a flock of wax or of um, snow buntings sighted last week over on Pegger Road flying around, so they're a little bit early. But the males come up first because originally they were um, crevice nesters, and there aren't that many crevices. They nest up on the north slope, so they're looking for a little rock crevices and it's, it was in limited supply. Right now if you go up to Prudhoe Bay in the springtime they're nesting in pipe. Um, so it's the modern crevice. So it's there's not so much competition but the males still show up before the females and defend the territory and wait for the females to come up a little bit later when the, um, the conditions ameliorate a little bit. Um, Northern Shrike is a predator, um, a predatory songbird um, that come up and feed on our uh, feeder birds. So um, they come up and uh, make a living on red poles and chickadees and things like that and there are more and more of them staying over winter. Um, the nut hatches, um, and that's a right side up nut hatch. They work their way down the tree upside down, head first that way. Um, there's another insectivore that uh, is starting to appear in higher numbers here in the winter time. So there, are, we have lots of company here in the winter time and they all have their own adaptations that allow them to do that. So um, as we go about our days out, if we're skiing or snow machining or just walking, waiting for spring to come, it's um, interesting to think about these other creatures that share our space and the ways that um, they've adapted to live up here without um, smart wool and polar fleece and, um, and Toyo stoves. Um, and as we're sitting in our cozy houses, um, all nice and warm, uh, let's think about those guys that are spending the night out over the aurora. <laughs> Thanks for your time.